low fanatics, my true crime fanatics. How are you doing? Yeah, um, I'm kitting up today, although this is a very old video. <laughs> you wait till you see what I'm kitting up. You'll you'll understand. Uh, <laughs> this video is sitting on my phone, but look, it's Leona. Um, yeah, I hadn't used this video or released it at the time. So, I thought, let's do Murder, Mystery and Kitting Up Sunday. Yeah, no, it's kind of where the inspiration came from. It's Bailey. She does uh, Murder, Mystery and Makeup. Uh, I don't do makeup. I do diamond painting. So, yeah, I thought I would use the content of the video. It's sat on my phone, so you might find a couple of throwback um, kitten ups in here because I've also kitted up my 100 colour uh, lion cub, I call it, but it's Little King. I've also got that video on here and some other ones. So maybe we should do murder mystery and kitten up sunday yeah i hope you're all well and um yeah come in grab a project that you're working on don't paint alongside me and uh we're going to talk about true crime today i know some of you like kitten up videos but don't necessarily like true crime but i'm just using the content that i had on my phone and uh, I, I've got a true crime story lined up, like mother, like son. So it's going to be an interesting case, a very interesting case. Uh, my week, uh, it's been hectic. Uh, I've been working very, very hard. Um, I had five designs, ten rounds, ten squares of each. I've had them dropped to my headquarters and I'm currently boxing those up making up goodie bags for them I did run out of organza bags uh but yeah I've been making those up and getting them ready to ship out I have only a couple of Ella's left oh my gosh you guys are loving Ella um we're now going through Easter Hop um and they are being dispatched as we speak I love having them in my house because you get them all within a week uh, rather than having to wait. So that is a good thing. But yeah, we've got a couple of new designs coming. Uh, I have a couple of YouTube friends releasing those. So stay tuned for that uh, next week. Okay, let's dive into this true crime. This is what we're here for, right? You don't need to hear about me. Uh, I will do a whip and chat talking about me and my problems in my real life um later on in the week uh, i hope to anyway i'm not i'm not a one for talking about my personal life so much if you know what i mean um all work and no play right but anyway let's move on grab your projects grab um juice wine tea, coffee, whatever, whatever takes your fancy, come down paint, right? Get some of your project done while we listen to um, a true crime story time. Or as it is now, murder, mystery and kitten up Sunday. <laughs> I kind of like that. It kind of goes together. Uh, maybe I'll do all my kitten ups with a true crime and then just do whipping chats where I'm diamond painting. That might be fun. Okay, so let's begin. Are we ready? Comfortable? You ready to begin? Okay. 90 miles east of New York City is home to Pocono Mountains, a majestic area that's popular year-round, uh, a vacation spot for New Yorkers. The vast mountains, lakes, streams and woods make it a perfect place for anything from fishing to boating, 
mountain biking, skiing and golfing. The Conkel family, I'm assuming that's how we say it, had deep roots dating back to the early German and Pennsylvania Dutch immigrants. In the centre of Monroe County was a small village named Conkel Town that got its name from Joseph Conkel, one of its first successful business owners in the area almost 200 years ago. Cheryl Conkel was born in 1969 and raised in the area by her father, who ran a junkyard that sold scrap metal and reusable car parts. Growing up in, at the junkyard, that gave Cheryl a rough exterior that made her into a tomboy. She played baseball, worked on cars, rode a motorcycle and was every bit as tough as any boy in the small town. In 1986, at just 17, Cheryl found herself pregnant and dropped out of school to take care of the baby that she named Gregory Rowe. Before his first birthday, however, Cheryl had grown tired of Greg's father, Geoffrey, and the couple broke up. Now, Cheryl did not want to be with Geoffrey, but she also didn't want him to be with anyone else. When he started dating another woman, Cheryl became spiteful and refused to let him see his son. As a result, Greg spent his childhood believing that his father wanted nothing to do with him. The truth, however, was that his mother was keeping Greg and his father apart. Some of Jeffrey's, the dad, some of his relatives didn't even know he had a son because Cheryl had refused to let them see each other. Cheryl was angry, an overbearing mother that was critical of every move Greg made throughout his life. She associated him with his father, whom she despised. She saw Geoffrey's face every time she looked at Greg. Her relatives grew accustomed to Cheryl dropping Greg off at their doorstep without notice any time she had an errand to run. Greg grew up feeling that his aunt Cindy, not me, was more of a mother figure than his own mother was. Cheryl was a hard worker though. She spent years working manual labour jobs that were typically more suitable for men. A welder, construction, a forklift driver, laying blacktop on roads, parking lots. The work paid well. Cheryl bought a house and drove a Mercedes. It made her happy thinking that maybe she had shed the image from being the air quote junkyard family. Ben Amato moved to the area from New York City in the mid 90s. The 47 year old had retired from the New York sanitation department where he had worked as a truck mechanic. The Poconos offered what he considered a relaxed retirement. He started a snowplow business, worked as a volunteer firefighter and fixed up vintage cars. While looking for car parts, Ben would often rummage through Cheryl's father's junkyard. Although he was 
almost 20 years older than 28-year-old Cheryl, she saw stability in Ben and started flirting with him. Ben was more than receptive and the two started dating. Though she was rough, Ben was excited to have a younger woman so interested in him. Best of all, he got along with 12-year-old Greg. Over the next several months, Ben showered Greg with gifts and more expensive gifts for Cheryl. He was in love and perhaps she was too. But it all changed when Cheryl realised she was pregnant with Ben's child. Her demeanour instantly shifted and she stopped answering his phone calls without notice. After repeated attempts to reach her, she finally broke the news to Ben. It was over. Suddenly, she wanted nothing to do with him. She planned to keep the child, but wanted to raise it on her own and didn't want him involved at all. Cheryl broke off all contact. Ben spiralled into a deep depression. It wasn't just the loss of his love, Cheryl, but the loss of the son he would never meet. The once happy-go-lucky man had become reclusive and private. He wouldn't speak to any of his friends and family about his situation, instead keeping his, fam his feelings hidden inside. Cheryl gave birth to her second boy in November 1998, giving him the surname Conkle instead of his father's name, Amato. Meanwhile, Ben saw therapists that prescribed antidepressants. A year later, he attempted suicide and failed. He tried again the following year. His friends and family were at a loss for what they could do. That's so sad. That's so sad. Similar to Geoffrey, uh, Greg's dad, you know, in the beginning, Cheryl had pushed Ben aside and denied any contact with his son. Over time, Ben seemed to emerge from his depression. He decided that he was going to fight Cheryl for custody of their son. But Cheryl fought dirty. She assumed that if she filed harassment charges against Ben before the custody hearing, the judge would look poorly upon him in court. Cheryl charged that Ben had been stalking her ever since he decided he wanted to share custody of the boy. The judge, however, saw through her charade and told Cheryl, quote, Just because he drives past your house doesn't mean he's stalking you. End quote. Cheryl startled the judge when she blurted, quote, What do I have to do to get him to leave me alone? Do I have to beep, kill him? End quote. Although she said it on a whim, she wasn't joking. In August 2001, she asked her friend, April Steinhauser, if she knew someone that could, quote, knock off my ex-boyfriend for five thousand dollars, end quote. April quickly replied, yeah I do. Cheryl 
knew April was a crack cocaine addict and was likely to hang around the type of people that could arrange a murder for hire. April told her she wouldn't have to look far. Her boyfriend, Nate Evans, could do the job. Cheryl met with Nate to arrange the hit. But during their discussions, Cheryl couldn't... She, she, yeah, she, she was having trouble deciding how she wanted the job done. She told him to shoot him inside his house. Or follow him home and shoot him as he got out of his truck. The more she thought about it, however, Cheryl realised it would be best to make it look like an accident. Or better yet, a suicide. Ben had already attempted suicide twice. It would be believable. Cheryl gave Nate a photo of Ben and drew him the layout of his house. When Cheryl opened her safe to pay Nate, she rethought her original $5,000 price. Mm, It's a bit much. She offered him $3,000 instead. One thousand five now, and the rest when the job is done. In his mind, Nate had already spent the money on his and April's next fix. He quickly took whatever Cheryl offered. Nate, however, was no killer. Neither was April. They were only interested in the money and after seeing Cheryl open her safe their motivation changed. A few days after the initial meeting Nate and April broke into Cheryl's house and stole from her safe which held an additional $6,500. When Cheryl realised her safe had been stolen she was livid and she reported it to the police. She told them exactly who to look for. Nathaniel Evans and April Steinhauser. But before the police could question them, Cheryl confronted Nate, demanded her money back and threatened to press charges. However, Nate replied, quote, Don't forget, I'm the guy you paid to murder your ex-boyfriend. End quote. Cheryl knew if she pressed charges against Nate in April, they could drag her down with them. Cheryl called the police and told them she wanted to drop all the charges against Nate and April. Now, I call that karma. Yeah, kind of serves her right. Three months later, in early November 2001, Ben's neighbours noticed his two dogs had been on his front porch for several days, but they hadn't seen Ben. His neighbours knew that he battled depression for the past three years and worried that he may have attempted suicide one more time. They called the police to do a welfare check. When the police arrived, they found Ben at the bottom of his basement stairs. He was face down in a pool of his own blood. At first look, police believed that Ben had fallen down the fire flight of stairs, hit his head and died. However, an autopsy and a forensic examination of the scene proved otherwise. The medical examiner determined Ben had been dead for five days before they found his body. They found pepper spray on his face 
and on the walls at the top of the stairs. Ben had died of blunt, blunt force trauma, but not from the fall. Someone had repeatedly beaten him on the head with a large cylindrical object. But the most telling piece of evidence was a boot print at the bottom of the stairs. Someone had stepped in his blood while it was fresh and tracked it on the basement floor. When Ben's stepdaughter heard of his death, she knew it had to be the work of Cheryl Conkle. He and Cheryl were just weeks away from a child custody hearing and he seemed to be overcoming his depression. His stepdaughter wasn't the only one that suspected Cheryl. The judge that presided over Cheryl's harassment charge, Debbie York, alerted the detectives of what Cheryl had said in court. What do I have to do to get him to leave me alone? Do I effing have to kill him? Though suspicion clearly pointed towards Cheryl, detectives had no physical evidence that pointed directly to her. Cheryl often wore work boots, but the bloody boot print didn't match any boots in her possession. Two years had passed with no new clues or an arrest in the case. There was still one thing that puzzled investigators. The burglary accusation that Cheryl suddenly dropped three months before Ben's death. Cheryl had accused Nate Evans of the burglary, but she mysteriously withdrew the charge. Detectives wanted to know why. Nate Evans had been arrested on an unrelated charge, let me guess it was drugs, and was sitting in jail at the time of Ben's death. He couldn't have done it. Detectives met with Nate in jail, sat him down and asked, quote, Do you know why you're here? End quote. Nate's reply shocked them. Quote, yeah, you're here about us getting paid by that lady to kill that dude. End quote. Nate and April both told police that Cheryl had paid them to kill Ben, but they had no intention of following through. They should have reported it though, shouldn't they? But they're druggies, I guess. Okay. Not that that excuses it. But they just wanted the fix. They weren't going to do anything. Um, They were only interested in stealing her money. And said that they used the money to buy new bicycles for April's daughters. They spent any remaining cash on drugs and alcohol. The new information wasn't enough to arrest Cheryl for murder but they could at least arrest her for solicitation to commit murder. Cheryl Conkle sat in jail for several months, but eventually raised money for bail and was released awaiting trial. For the next year and a half, detectives built a case against Cheryl but hoped that additional evidence would present itself so they could arrest her for Ben's murder. Detectives would get their murder charge, but not in the manner that they had hoped. Cheryl's son, Greg, was 17 in 2003 and lived with his mother, and his younger brother. 
he worked laying blacktop for Cheryl's company and had been dating a 16-year-old local girl named Kristen Fisher. However, Greg and Kristen's relationship had fallen apart when Kristen became pregnant with their child. Greg refused to acknowledge that the baby was his. He demanded she have an abortion, but Kristen refused. She made up her mind and she was planning to raise the baby with or without him. In October 2003, Kaylee Elizabeth Fisher was born, but Greg wanted to nothing to do with the little girl. Oh my gosh. By early May 2004, Greg and Kristen were embroiled in a legal battle. Just as Cheryl had suspected, Kristen had filed a domestic relations complaint against Greg and was suing for child support. Cheryl attended mediation with her son before he and Kristen went to court. Cheryl was cold and angry. She pointed at Kaylee across the table and snarled at Kristen. Is that really his? I don't think it's his. Kristen and her mother Kathleen there's a lot of names being bandied about. I'm sorry. Kristen and her mother Kathleen spoke on the phone on the morning of May the 4th. The child support hearing was scheduled for the following afternoon and Kristen told her mother, quote, Greg is on his way over. He said he had a surprise for me and Kaylee. Kathleen, her mum, was worried. She said, don't let him in the house. You know what he's capable of. But Kristen told her mother it was too late. Greg had just arrived, but don't worry. Kathleen arrived home at 5.30pm that evening and opened the garage door to find Kristen on the garage floor. A thin white rope tied into a noose hung loosely round her neck. The other end of the rope was attached to the garage door, the, the opener railings of the garage door. An overturned stool laid nearby. Can you even imagine? Kathleen ran to her daughter, but it was far too late. She was cold. Frantically, Kathleen rushed into the house looking for Kaylee. She ran from room to room. There was no sign of the baby. She was troubled by the lack of crying. Had Greg taken Kaylee? But when Kathleen entered, oh no, no, no. When Kathleen entered the downstairs bathroom, she collapsed to her knees. Her seven month old granddaughter was lifeless, face down in a half filled bathtub. When police arrived, it was obvious someone staged the scene to look like Kristen had killed her daughter, then committed suicide. The noose was loose around her neck, certainly not tight enough to have killed her. Also, the tops of her feet were dirty, but the bottoms were clean, an indication that someone had dragged her to the garage. An autopsy confirmed that she had been strangled rather than hanged. 
Typically, Kristen wore sweatpants around the house, but she was dressed in her street clothes and the diaper bag was packed, indicating that she was planning on leaving the house. Generally, it wasn't something someone would do before drowning their own baby and committing suicide. When the police questioned neighbours, one man had noticed a Honda Civic parked in front of Kristen's house that day. He hadn't recognised the vehicle, thought it looked out of place and had the foresight to write down the licence plate number. When police checked the registration, the car was registered jointly to Greg and Cheryl. Police arrived with a warrant at Greg's home, where he was living with dear old mummy. Cheryl was furious that the police were rummaging through her house. When she went into the garage, the detectives told her specifically not to go near the Honda Civic, but she brazenly ignored their commands. Cheryl was arrested for hindering apprehension, obstructing justice and tampering with evidence. She claimed that she only wanted to get some CDs out of the car, but the investigators believed she was trying to hide the evidence. Cheryl had been out on bail awaiting trial on her own murder investigation of Ben. However, after obstructing justice charge they revoked her bail for the original charge and returned her to jail reporters watched as she entered the jail and asked her how she felt about her granddaughter's death she angrily barked back at the reporter quote granddaughter that's not my granddaughter my son was wearing a condom and the birth date does not make sense. End quote. During the sweep of the home, police collected Greg's computer, hoping to find emails between him and Kristen that would show problems in their relationship. But they found much more than they were looking for. Greg's computer contained seven photos and two videos of child pornography. (sighs) This is just a tro- it gets worse and worse and worse. Police charged Greg with nine counts of sexual abuse of children, nine counts of criminal attempt at dissemination, one count of criminal use of a computer and nine counts of obscene or other sexual materials. Despite the charges, Greg was released after posting a $10,000 bail but remained the prime suspect in the murder of Kristen and Kaylee. Thirteen days later, Cheryl's hindering apprehension charges were dropped, but it wasn't enough to get her out of jail. She remained in custody awaiting her trial for solicitation to commit murder. Over the next several weeks, detectives spoke to Kristen's friends and family One friend claimed that just days before her death, Greg had left Kristen a message on her voicemail threatening to kill her if she didn't drop the child support lawsuit. Although investigators weren't able to retrieve a copy of the message, telephone records confirmed that Greg had indeed called that day. The neighbour that saw Greg's Honda Civic parked 
outside her house on the day of the murder provided an important piece of evidence. However, the most damning piece of evidence came from an employee at a nearby True Value hardware store. The employee claimed Greg came into the store on the day of the murder and purchased a bundle of thin white rope. The same type of rope found around Kirsten, Kristen's neck. Greg's freedom didn't last long. After little more than a month, he was charged with two counts of first degree murder, two counts of third degree murder, possessing instruments of crime and endangering well, the welfare of children. If convicted, Greg faced the possibility of the death penalty. He insisted he did not kill his ex-girlfriend and daughter, but he knew who did. Guess who he blamed? I'll give you a second. You know, this family is, like, dysfunctional at best. He blamed his mum. Yep, his mum killed um, Kristen and Kaylee. He claimed that Cheryl not only killed them, but she killed her boyfriend, Ben. And he could prove it. Greg laid out the scene for the prosecution. He told them that two months before Ben's murder, he and his mother went to a sporting goods store where she told him to go inside and buy a can of bear repellent. The bear repellent later proved to be the pepper spray found on Ben's face and on the walls of the stairwell. Then, on the day Ben was murdered, he drove his mother to Ben's house, despite being only 15 years old. He regularly drove his mother around. He claimed he knew that she and Ben were in a child custody dispute and his mother instructed him to drive her to Ben's house. When they reached the house, Greg dropped her off and Cheryl told him to go about a mile away and wait for two hours. After two hours come back to the house and he did so he picked up his mother at the house he told prosecutors he had no idea what she had done Cheryl was excited and seemed to be in an adrenaline rush she instructed him to drive on the back roads on the way home he said his mother climbed into the back seat of the car removed her clothes and threw them out the window as they drove through the rural roads. She also threw a blood-stained baseball bat out of the window. When Greg asked his mother what she had done, she confessed, I killed him. She told him she sprayed Ben with pepper spray at the top of the stairs and beat him with a baseball bat. As he stumbled down the stairs, she beat him some more as he tried to fight her off. When he landed at the bottom of the stairs, she continued pummeling his head until he was dead. Greg told detectives that when he found out what she had done, he was furious with his mother. I don't think I believe that. He said he was only 15 at the time and he liked Ben. 
Quote, I felt it was my fault. I cried and went to my bedroom. End quote. Two days later, Cheryl was having second thoughts about her decision to throw her clothes and the murder weapon out of the window. You know, after the moving car. She told Greg to go back and find them. Greg, however, claimed he wanted nothing to do with murdering Ben. He lied to his mother and told her he couldn't find them. She later asked another friend, Jerry, that she had admitted to the murder to. Jerry refused to help her as well. Frustrated, Cheryl drove through the back roads on her own and found their items, brought them all home and burnt them. Investigators believed his story about Ben, but didn't believe that Cheryl also killed Kristen and Kaylee. Far too many pieces of evidence pointed directly at Greg. They knew his car had been parked outside. He made, he had made death threats to Kristen in the past and he was the one that purchased the rope that was found around her neck. During Greg's trial, his new girlfriend, Rachel, testified against him. She told the court that just two days before Kristen and Kaylee were murdered, Greg had asked her to search the internet for instructions on how to tie a hangman's noose. Greg sent letters to Rachel from prison in which he told her to remember three, three, three things during her testimony. He wanted her to lie for him. He told her to testify that he bought the rope only at his mother's request. And his mother had referred to Kristen as, quote, business you should have taken care of yourself, end quote. Lastly, his letter asked her to testify that it was his mother that asked for instructions on how to tie the noose, not him. Rachel told the court that Greg repeatedly told her if she didn't say these things in court, his mother would kill her. Greg's defence tried to blame the killings on Cheryl. But the jury didn't buy it. In January 2006, after six days of testimony and over five hours of deliberation, Greg Rowe was found guilty on two counts of first degree murder and one count of third degree murder. Greg faced the death penalty. His father, Geoffrey, whom he had only recently reconciled with, addressed the court and pleaded for his son's life. He told the court that he had no contact with Greg for years and was just getting to know him. Quote, I know my son didn't do this. Please don't take him from me. I... I know two innocent lives were lost, but taking his life won't make it right. Greg also pleaded, quote, I wanted to make my family proud of me. I know it's your opinion I did this, but I honestly tell you I did not. Please don't take me from my family, end quote. Ultimately, Greg was sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. 
The following year, in 2007, Greg was allowed outside of the prison walls, but only to testify against his mother at her trial. Wearing handcuffs, leg restraints and a black suit, Greg testified for two hours. He told the court that Cheryl admitted to him that she had killed Ben and he had driven her to and from the home that same day. He claimed that his mother had threatened him. She told him that if the police looked at her, she would take him down with her as an accomplice. Ben's attorney and personal friend testified that Ben told him repeatedly, quote, If I'm found dead, Cheryl did it. End quote. Debbie York, the judge that presided over Cheryl's harassment suit, testified about Cheryl's death threat outburst. At the time of the murder, Cheryl had been having an affair with a married police officer, Marty Reynolds. Reynolds took the stand to testify against her as well. He told the court that Cheryl had admitted to him she killed Ben, telling him, quote, we fought all the way down the stairs, end quote. She showed him the bruises on her thighs from the fight, then minutes later denied everything and told him the bruises were from a motorcycle accident. Quote, she was cuckoo, she was out there, end quote. That's what Marty Reynolds, the married police officer, said about Cheryl. Um, Cheryl would say something one minute and then backtrack it a minute later. Because Reynolds had withheld evidence about the murder, he was forced to resign from the police department where he had worked for almost 10 years. His pension was revoked and his wife divorced him. Now, I'm not being funny, uh, well deserved and... If he is a police officer, why the hell didn't he go to work with that information? He must have known they were looking into Cheryl. Now, okay, he he was having an affair with her. Uh, Could have been emotions attached, but... Oh, my gosh, no. I think that's well-deserved. And I'm glad the wife divorced him, too. Cheryl's close friend Jerry testified that she tried to get him to help find the baseball bat that she had thrown out the car window. He also testified that he watched her burn the bat and the clothes. April Steinhauser also testified that Cheryl had paid her and her boyfriend to murder Ben. It's not looking good, Cheryl. It's not looking good, love. Cheryl's defence admitted a cassette tape into evidence of a conversation between her and April, but the conversation was clearly staged, making her look even more guilty. There wasn't much doubt of Cheryl's guilt. In February 2007, she was found guilty of first-degree murder. Four months later, she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Ben's stepdaughter and daughter addressed Cheryl Conkle before she left the courtroom. Quote, The prison you will be transferred to will have lots of prisoners like you. When you look into those many evil eyes, may you finally see what my stepfather saw 
just before he took his last breath. End quote. Ben's daughter continued. Quote, last Sunday was Father's Day, and instead of taking my dad to dinner or having him over for a barbecue, I was sitting at a grave telling him Happy Father's Day and kissing a cold picture on a headstone. End quote. As Cheryl left the courtroom, reporters asked her how she felt about spending the rest of her life in prison. She replied, I don't intend to. In subsequent interviews from prison, Cheryl Kunkel still claims her innocence. And there you go. How awful. Um... I don't even know how to unpack that. I mean, you have this 15-year-old kid driving her to a murder scene and driving her home. Now, I guess the question we should be asking ourselves is did Greg um, murder Kristen and Kaylee? I'm inclined to say yes, he did because he was seen. And she said, oh, I've got to go, Greg's here. So that places him at the scene, not the mother. So sadly, I do think he did. He did, uh, I mean, it's one thing, I'm not condoning it by any means, but the brain kind of can comprehend the idea of making a lawsuit go away by murdering the person making the claim okay you can kind of justify that in your head and you can kind of say well uh, yeah okay but a seven month old baby and he drowned that baby in a bathtub that is a whole different level of sadism like beyond belief that I I needed that nearly broke me um yeah of course my heart truly truly goes out to Ben's family and to Kristen and Kaylee uh you know Kristen's family how tragic and the son pretty much followed in the mum's footsteps. It's um a very, very sad, very, very sad true crime. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah, as always, guys, please do leave your thoughts and comments down below. Um, I'm always, I always love hearing from you and, um, yeah, it's just so tragic, so, so, so tragic. And there there was, um, another boy, um, because she had two sons, didn't she? Makes you wonder what happened. I hope the, uh, the young lad was taken care of and, um, you know, not tarred with the same brush as his mother and his brother. Uh, yeah, I hope I hope he's living his best life and and has found peace with these two. Oh, there you go, guys. I I will leave it there. Um, thank you for joining me. Uh, yeah, please do. You know, chat with me in the comment section. Let me know what you think. Uh, this horrific, very tragic story. Oh my gosh. Gets a bit heavy on a Sunday evening, doesn't it? Thank you for joining me. I do appreciate it. Please do leave a thumbs up on the video. Come chat with me in the comment section. And 
let me know who you want me to talk about next week i do love your suggestions and uh okay guys i'm off to top my tea up and uh please do stay stay safe out there and uh yeah i will see you next sunday i know i took two weeks off uh i was overloaded with work over the last weekend um but sometimes i do just have to take a week off because as you can see it gets very very heavy um and it takes a lot of prep work research you know it's not just um turn up on sunday and talk about true crime i delve into these things and uh research them and you know try to bring you true crime content so sometimes i do need a week off just to step out right i'm out of here i keep saying this i uh, thank you thank you for joining me i do appreciate it and i will see you monday night live that's when I'll see you next, because it's murder, mystery, and kitten up Sunday. Bye, guys.